from a rotating vortex pair. So you see that you have a kind of a cluster of droplets here and a cluster of droplets here as well. And that's what we really want to look at in more detail is, is how, um, how the droplet sizes evolve within these counter-rotating vortex pairs and how that vortex actually affects which droplets get to stay and which are ejected. Okay, so we were able to look at those droplet sizes within this counter-rotating vortex pair uh, through that second position of our, our mini holocam. And so, so here's our, our sample measurement volume right here. So we're measuring right in the center of this, of this vortex. And here are the data for three different time points. So the earliest time point is in, in blue. And you can see that we have droplets that extend all the way up to about half a millimeter in size here. Um, but later on, later on at, at say 17.4 uh, seconds here in, in the green, we see that the largest droplet is only about 200 microns in size. So we have, we have droplets, larger droplets present at the beginning and then smaller droplets, only small droplets that are present near the end. And so we wanted to try to figure out why this was and try to, try to model this. And so um, we were able to uh, really look at the, um, the flow field, take the flow field in this um, counter-rotating vortex pair from our PIV data and we took a, a slice through that right here and extracted velocity profiles across this vortex. So here we have upward flow on the right-hand side and a downward flow on the left-hand side. And this is at the same three time points uh, essentially that I showed before. Now, um, in order to, to say which droplets stay within this vortex and which ones escape, we used uh, something called a trapping function. And the trapping function is, is really concept conceptually pretty simple. So we're, we're taking um, a flow, so this is a horizontal vortex like we have in our, our uh, vortex pair, and we're saying, we have an oil droplet, which is either on the upward side, so it would be potentially moving this way, or it could be on the downward side as well. And we're taking a ratio of the forces. So we, we have a ratio of the outward forces to the inward forces. And if, if, this is, if the value of this trapping function, which is omega, if omega is greater than one, then that droplet is going to tend to move outward and escape from the vortex. If omega star is, is less than one, however, that droplet will tend to move inwards and remain trapped by the vortex. And so this depends on, on factors such as the density of the droplet, the density of the seawater, uh, the rising speed of the droplet in still water, and uh, the velocity of the, of the vortex as well, of course. And so um, we applied this model, this uh, simple model, to our, our situation and plotted it versus the... Um, so on the x-axis here, we have the velocity that the droplet would experience. This is the velocity relative to the vortex center. Um, on the y-axis, we have um, the, this trapping function, omega. So again, if omega is greater than one, the droplet's going to escape. If it's less than one, it will be trapped. And then we plotted um, characteristic droplet sizes of, of 50 microns, 100, 200, and 400 microns on these lines. So the lines that are solid represent when the droplet is on the upward side of a vortex. So we have a droplet, we have a vortex moving round and round like this. So this would be a droplet that's on the upward side of the vortex. The dotted lines here represent cases where the droplet would be found on the, the downward side of the vortex. So, so what do we see? So for the, the downward side of the vortex with the, the dotted lines, we see that all the values of omega are less than one. So this means that all the droplets that are on the downward side, regardless of their size, are going to remain trapped. What about droplets on the upward side, though? It turns out that droplets on the upward side can escape. So we see that, for instance, a 400 micron droplet is always going to escape. Um, a 200 micron droplet is going to escape up to a, a vortex speed of about this value. But a 50 micron droplet is going to remain trapped. So it's going to remain trapped in the vortex, moving around with the vortex instead of escaping. And so we were able to compare the predicted values of which droplet sizes would remain trapped versus our actual measurements within this vortex. And it turns out that, that they matched really well. So the holography measurements showed that, the, or showed that 95% of the droplets are within this predicted diameter range at, one at the earlier time point, and then 99% of the droplets are within this predicted range at the later time point. So just to, to draw a few uh, conclusions from this part of, of the talk, um, we see that uh, these crude oil plumes in a cross flow um, generate a significant uh, counter-rotating vortex pair. 
And they also ge generate these wig droplets beneath, uh, beneath the, um, the main structure. And these vortices really affect the, the spatial distribution of, of the droplets. Uh, the chemical dispersant, when you add that into the oil, you mix it in, um, that generates much, much smaller droplets. And then these become entrained in, the, in those large scale vortex structures. And then finally, we were able to trap, or rather we were able to predict the size of droplets that would be trapped within these vortices based on this balance of forces um, for a droplet caught within a vortex. So that's, um, that's the first part of my talk, which is, for, I guess, for the physical oceanographers in the room. Um, and now I'd like to, to switch gears completely and talk about um, zooplankton ecology and locomotion. So this is for the, the biological oceanographers in the room. So, so I, um, as Gary mentioned, I was able to work uh, with Jeanette Yen uh, during my PhD. And so I was able to work with a, a wide variety of, of critters during my time at Georgia Tech. Um, everything from copepods to krill to daphnia um, and pteropods. And so, you know, zooplankton ecology and locomotion are, are, or ecology is really tied to locomotion and, and animal sensory capabilities. And so I was able to look at a, a variety of projects kind of encompassing this area. One of these was the looking at Hesperodiaptomus Shoshone, which is a copepod found in these high mountain lakes up in, up in the Rockies. Um, just to give an, another example of something that I worked on, um, we looked at copepods and how they escape from, um, from suction feeding predators, such as fish. So here we have a, a Calanus finmarchicus on the left. Here we have a, a sort of impulsive siphon, which is mimicking um, the kind of suction that a, a fish would have. And you can see that it's able to escape. So you know, Calanus are, are really good at escaping. On the right-hand side, we have this, the same Hesperodiaptomus Shoshone, and uh, it lives in fishless lakes. And it's, <laughs> bless its heart, it's not really good at escaping. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so, fun, so that was one of my projects at Georgia Tech. Um, but what I want to talk about today is, is aquatic propulsion and this kind of dichotomy between what we see as drag-based rowing. So this is where animals use their appendages as, as paddles to kind of push themselves through the water. Um, and that would be, for an example of that would be Antarctic krill, which we see, see here. So here it has five pairs of, of pleopods, which is using to, to paddle through the water. It's not very efficient. It's very common at, at Reynolds numbers. Lots of zooplankton use this as a, as a locomotion technique. And then we can contrast that with lift-based flapping, which is something that, for instance, a, a turtle would do, um, to, would do with its, with its uh, flippers. Um, and this is much more efficient. Um, it's much more common at high speeds and higher Reynolds numbers. Um, so larger animals would tend to, to move with this sort of locomotion, or this, this kind of base their, their locomotion on these physics. So the, the organism that I wanted to study, that we wanted to study, was the sea butterfly, Limusina helicina, um, which is, of course, a very important uh, polar species. Um, it's under threat from uh, ocean acidification because it has a calcareous shell that is being eroded by um, acidic water. It's, it's a snail, for those who aren't actually familiar with it. It's a, it's a, a sea snail. Um, it has a shell, a coiled shell, and um, its foot has been modified into a pair of, of these wings, essentially. They're, they're called parapodia. And the shell can range from a le less than a millimeter up to about a centimeter in diameter. They beat their, uh, their wings at about 5 to 10 beats per second, and this results in them swimming at about 5 to 50 uh, millimeters per second. This puts them at a Reynolds number of about 5 to 100, which is pretty low. That's, that's the range that a lot of zooplankton will swim in. And like I said before, a lot of zooplankton use this drag-based locomotion technique. But this doesn't really look like drag-based locomotion. It's, it's kind of hard to say, but just from looking at this, it, it kind of looks like the animal is, is sort of flying through the water. And so this has been a question, kind of a long-standing question, is, well, how is this animal actually swimming? What are the physics behind its locomotion? And here you can see a, a high-speed video showed down. You can see it's kind of rocking back and forth as it's beating its wings um, and, as swimming upwards. So we wanted to characterize its swimming behavior. Um, and you know, its kinematics, the fluid dynamics that it uses to swim, uh, using tomographic uh, particle image velocimetry. And so um, tomographic PIV, for those who aren't familiar, it's a, it's a, syst it's a system where we have uh, four cameras, four or more cameras that are all looking at the same volume, the same measurement volume. And they're looking at it from different angles. 
And this, uh, this measurement volume is seeded with light reflecting particles. So this would, for instance, be within your, your aquarium where your animal is. Um, it's seeded with these particles, and then it's um, illuminated by a laser. So we have this laser illuminated volume with these four cameras looking at it. You take, uh, you take two sets of images in quick succession. So time t, t, you know, t, and then times t plus d delta t. So you end up with these two sets of four images apiece. And then you're able to reconstruct these into a, a three-dimensional light intensity volume. So this is essentially pinpointing where all of those particles are in 3D space within your measurement volume at two different time points. You can then cross-correlate subregions of those volumes against each other in order to produce, to produce a, a three-dimensional, three-component velocity vector volume. So you get velocity information in 3D throughout the entire volume of, of measurement. And so um, this is kind of a schematic of our system. We used uh, four phantom cameras that could film up to 2,000 frames per second. Um, these guys are pretty small, right, these, these pteropods. And so we were using 200 millimeter lenses with a 2x teleconverter to further increase the magnification. Um, we were using Scheinflug mounts to help correct for off-axis distortion. And then for illumination, we were using two uh, continuous 7 watt lasers. Um, and these are firing in the near IR range at 808 nanometers um, in this counter-propagating position. So we have these two la lasers essentially firing towards each other. And this is to both um, increase the power um, and then also to prevent shadowing. If we have an, an animal in our measurement volume, we wouldn't be able to see the light on the other side of the animal. So we have two lasers firing towards each other. We, we prevent this shadowing. So the, the end result of this is that we ended up with a, an interrogation volume of about one to two cubic centimeters. Okay, so what, what does this actually look like? So this is a, a photo, these are a couple of photos of the setup. We have a large, largish optical table, uh, optical rails. We have our four cameras mounted on rails. Um, here we have one of our lasers, which would be firing to the left here. And this is where the, um, the aquarium would go. Okay, so we, we had some animals very kindly shipped to us from um, uh, Bill Peterson out in, out in Oregon. And um, we were able to use those in our setup uh, at, at Georgia Tech in one of the cold rooms there. And so, um, so yeah, this is the kind of footage that we get. This is at 500 frames per second and slowed down, I think, 10 times. And so you can see the, the animal is swimming upwards. You can see that it's, uh, it's actually quite transparent in terms of or the parapodia are, are pretty transparent. Um, it seems to be doing this sort of a, a power stroke right here where it moves up a lot and then this recovery stroke where it doesn't move up as much. And so you can see some of the particles moving around, around the animal um, as, as well. So that's how we can track the fluid. So um, from these four videos that we have simultaneously of the animal, we're able to reconstruct the body kinematics. So how is the animal actually moving in space? So here are the, the body tracks for two different animals that are swimming upwards. And you can see that it has this kind of a zigzag sawtooth pattern up as it does a, a power stroke in one direction and then a, a recovery stroke in the other direction. So the, the power strokes here are in black and then the, the recovery stroke is in gray. And as I said before, this, this tilts or this pitches the animal tremendously forward and backward as it's upwards. So it does a power stroke and rolls in one direction and then it does a recovery stroke and it rolls in the other direction. And of course this animal is, is kind of a disc, like a disc, so it's able to roll quite easily through the water. Now that rolling, this pitching, actually turns out to be very important for how it moves its wings as well, its wing kinematics. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. So, so we were able to extract uh, body and wing uh, kinematics. So here we have uh, time on the x-axis. Um, on the left y-axis, we have the body, uh, the body angle in degrees, and that's the black here. And then on the right-hand side, we have the speed of the animal, which is the gray diamonds. The shaded areas here are the power stroke, and the non-shaded areas are, are the recovery stroke. So we see this kind of a, a repeating pattern where the, the animal is moving up, uh, is, is moving quite quickly during the power stroke, and then it moves up or has another kind of peak in its speed during the recovery stroke. And throughout both the strokes, you see this tremendous rotation of the body. So this goes from about 90 degrees down to about 30 degrees. That's 60 degrees of pitching back and forth as it's swimming. Um, that seems to be more than any other animal pitches under normal locomotion 
Um, so we, we weren't able to find another animal that pitches this much under normal locomotion. And so we're, we're calling this hyperpitching. And that hyperpitching also affects where, uh, it also affects how the wings generate lift. So if you look at the wingtips in a body-centered coordinate system, so that's, that's what's represented here with the, the black representing the power stroke and then the open representing the recovery stroke, you see the wingtips move in this kind of a strange pattern and it's not exactly clear how this would generate lift, right? It's kind of a down and then back up and to the side. But when you do a, a, re, you do a transformation and you include body rotation in that, it transforms into this very classic, really beautiful figure eight pattern, this sideways figure eight pattern that is very reminiscent of what a lot of insects do, actually. So um, a lot of insects will move their wings in this kind of a figure eight pattern back and forth like this. So that made us think, hey, this animal could actually be using a lot of the, the fluid dynamics of, of insect flight. So we, we pursued this further by looking at the fluid dynamics of how it swims. And so here we have a movie showing um, the fluid dynamics going through the kind of the center of the body. Um, the, the vectors uh, indicate um, the, the, the direction of motion and then the, the color contours represent the, the vorticity or the rotation of the fluid. And so it's probably easiest to show this if I, if I just show a couple stills. But it turns out that the, the, the pteropod is using this, this mechanism that's actually very common in insect flight, and it's called the clap and fling mechanism. Um, and in this mechanism, you have, say, a, the body that looks like this and the wings that are, are clapped together at the beginning of a power stroke. And at this, as it begins a power stroke, it kind of uh, opens them up and forms this V. And that makes fluid rush in to fill that gap. And as it does that, you have these leading edge vortices that are created on the wingtips. And these vortices are, are lift generating mechanisms. And so we, that's exactly what we see here with the, the PIV data. So here we have it opening its wings. We have the start of these uh, leading edge vortices here and here. And then those grow stronger. And so those are actual um, uh, lift generating mechanisms. So this is, again, something that insects will do when they're flying as well. So we, we came to the conclusion that these sea butterflies are, in fact, honorary insects. Um, they're using the same fluid dynamics to, to swim as these insects, such as thrips and fruit flies, are using to fly. Um, the Reynolds number for all of these organisms is right about the same. It's kind of in this five to several hundred range. All of them are using a high angle of attack during the power stroke and recovery stroke, which I didn't mention before. And all of them use this clap and fling mechanism as well. So, so we can kind of say that these sea butterflies are actually sort of like butterflies. So, um, so that, uh, that kind of concludes the work that I've done. I just wanted to mention a few projects that I wanted to kind of uh, begin um, well, uh, you know, here. So um, I'm very interested in these, these very small-scale uh, physical and biological phenomena or processes at the air-sea interface. So I worked on this one before, as, as Gary mentioned. I looked at how when you have an oil slick on the surface and when you have a raindrop impinging or splashing on that oil slick, you get this, um, you get this spray of very fine droplets, these oily droplets that people could inhale. And this is really an unrecognized um, health risk to oil spill cleanup workers. So I'd like to continue working on something like this, but incorporate drones into my research because drones are great. Um, <laughs> and so I'd actually like to do, to do some sort of measurement um, Put, mount some measurement devices on drones so that we can take some of these devices to the field and take these measurements to the field. I'm also interested in um, snowflake impact. So this is the impact of a single snowflake uh, on seawater. It's probably hard to see, but, but what I found is that you have hundreds of very small micro bubbles entrained along with this, this snowflake. And I think this is an unrecognized source of marine aerosol as those uh, bubbles will come back up to the surface and burst. And so I'm, I'm interested in kind of um, interested in looking at this mechanism some as well. And then the biology at, at the air-sea interface is really interesting as well, looking at this whole class of organisms known as the Neuston. I, I want to use some of these um, flow measurement techniques with some really interesting organisms that live right at that interface. So with that, I'd be happy to take some questions. I'd like to acknowledge many, many people who contributed to this research, both from Hopkins and then from Georgia Tech as well. Um, so yeah, uh, that concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to take uh, questions.